Pace at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. The San Antonio City Council is set to vote on a new council district map tomorrow morning and cap off its local redistricting process. The U.S. Census showed a huge population difference between the biggest and smallest council districts, a deviation of nearly 35 percent. It's supposed to be less than 10. Our Garrett Berger shows you where the new map draws the line. In a unanimous vote of the members present Saturday afternoon, an advisory committee approved this map to send to city council. The red lines show where the boundaries are now, while the multicolored portions show where they would go. These changes, the results of six and a half months of meetings. So I'd say they had about four different versions. This is the first time city council has appointed a citizens committee to do the map drawing and get input from residents. Council does have the power to amend what the committee has come up with, but they likely won't. Instead, they're expected to just vote a straight yes or no. They want to give weight to their work, right? So if we're going to put them together, then what is it for? The city has to get the total deviation between the biggest and smallest districts down to under 10%. The proposed plan gets it to about 8.8. .8. Only District 2 and 3 remain unchanged. But in general, more populated north side districts had to shrink. So the smaller districts around downtown and the west side could grow. The differences may not be like in a, a great landmass, but to those neighborhoods, I think they're fairly significant. If the new map puts you into a new district, it doesn't change what kind of resources or services you have access to. You can still use the same libraries, community centers, but it will change which council member you call if you have an issue, but only once we hit the May 2023 election. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Several emblems of pride vandalized on the campus of St. Philip's College. Rainbow flags and rainbow letter diversity signs were ripped to shreds, left for students and staff to find this morning. All of this happening in the midst of Pride Month. It's really messed up because people want to celebrate their month. Everyone should be free. Everyone has the right to be who they are. Campus officials say the person responsible did not damage any of the Juneteenth signs that are also up, only targeting those related to Pride Month. Campus police are investigating but don't have a suspect description. Pride Center San Antonio's Robert Salcedo saying that in today's climate, the vandalism is not surprising. But it's still disheartening uh, to know that it's happening here in our own community. In my opinion, should raise another flag. We can't be silenced um, or be put in fear. And that is exactly what happened. St. Phillips has replaced all the damaged signs and flags. As we just said, June marks Pride Month, a time to celebrate the history, culture, people of the LGBTQ plus community. But the mood has changed in light of recent events, including the Idaho Pride Parade arrests and a Dallas drag queen event for kids that sparked outrage. So we reached out to Ray Lopez Entertainment, a company that represents several drag queens and performers throughout San Antonio, and they recently hosted a kid-friendly Disney-themed drag queen brunch. They tell our Alicia Barrera it's not about sexualizing anyone, but instead it's about spreading love and happiness. She's the belle of the ball in nightclubs and gay pride festivals. By birth, he's Darius Williams, but with a little makeup, jewels, and custom outfits, transforms into a fierce drag queen. My stage name is Megan Iman Deluxe. Megan has been entertaining crowds for more than five years. When you perform, it's, it's very fun and exciting to see the audience reaction and how they uh, react to, you know, people doing flips or cartwheels or splits and everything, and they love it. And while Florida and Texas Republican lawmakers push for laws to ban kids from drag shows, the show must go on. It makes me want to have fun. But in the back of her mind and of those she performs alongside with, there's fear. In our line of work or, or you know, just being a part of the LGBTQ community, you're always going to have to kind of watch out and be on edge. It's just something that, you know, we have to live with. Always keeping an eye out for protesters like the 31 extremists arrested near the Pride event in Idaho. We don't know what they're going to do or what they can do or with, if they have any weapons or anything with them because we don't got no weapons. What they do have is a desire to live authentically and inspire others to do the same. And we're here to make people happy, to have, to get people away from their problems for just a moment. I never thought that I would grow up to be this superhero, this amazing, beautiful superhero. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. 
San Antonio fire investigators looking for the cause of a late night fire at an apartment complex on the northwest side. Fire crews responded to the call at the Park 10 apartment homes around 1130 last night along Loop 410. When firefighters got there, they say the flames were coming from the building where the fitness center, the laundry room and the office were located. Didn't take long to take care of that fire. Officials say it appears the fire started in that office space, but they're still working on an exact cause. No one was inside at the time and no one was hurt. The San Antonio police arresting this man after they say he fired a gun at his girlfriend's car. It's 28 year old Paul Riojas. He's been charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. According to an arrest affidavit, it happened yesterday outside of his own home. Officers say the woman was trying to leave and Riojas fired several shots, hitting her car several times, but did not hit her. The community of Uvalde saying yet another final goodbye. A prayer service and memorial was held today for 11 year old Layla Salazar. She was a fourth grade student killed inside Robb Elementary three weeks ago. Layla being remembered by friends and family for her love of swimming and dancing and singing along with her dad to Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses on the way to school every morning. Funeral services for Layla are tomorrow. New at six, the goal is to keep families together, and sometimes that means having to reunify them. Judge Peter Sakai retired, now running for county judge after overseeing the Bear County Children's Court. Since then, Judge Monica Diaz stepped in to preside over the early childhood and family drug court dockets. She sat down with Erica Hernandez to talk about that goal of reunifying families. We know families are the backbone of our society. That focus is why Judge Monique Diaz is continuing Judge Peter Sakai's work through two innovative Child Protective Services specialty courts, Early Childhood Court and Family Drug Court. Those are two CPS dockets that are created to reunify families with their children at a more rapid rate than you would otherwise see through a normal CPS case. Families within these courts go through about a six-month program so far, they have proven to work. According to Judge Diaz, in the past 15 years, the Family Drug Court has been able to reunify more than 1,000 children with their parents. The Early Childhood Court, created in 2015, has already reunified more than 200 children. We have greater success rates through these programs for parents to be reunified with their children than we do in the entire body of CPS cases as a whole. And recently, several families completed the program and they were reunified with their children. Congratulations. This virtual commencement ceremony held last week celebrated the successes of these families and it's something Judge Diaz hopes more families work toward. Everyone can change, but they have to be open to receiving the help, open to change. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic right now. I want to show you I-35 in Flores. I believe this is the lower level there where you can see traffic is really backed up. I believe this is the southbound lanes of I-35 at Flores that are being backed up. You can see the on-ramp also very slow going. Not sure exactly what's happening. Maybe it's just the normal give and take this hour, but something that caught our attention at 35 in Flores. Well, new at six, you can weigh in on the future of the Institute of Texan Cultures, UTSA, asking for the public's input on what to do with that museum that stood at Hemisphere Park for more than five decades. RJ Marquez spoke with the UTSA, UTSA chair of the committee that's overseeing the next steps for the ITC and what options are on the table. It is one of the most iconic and recognizable buildings in San Antonio telling the story of Texas. The Institute of Texan Cultures really is about sharing the rich mosaic and tapestry that comprises Texas, not only the current, but also the future. The future of the museum, which was established in 1968, is up for discussion. This week, UTSA released a draft report that includes three different scenarios for the museum's future. One of which involves relocating out of the Texas Pavilion um, and, and away from the Hemisphere District. One of them involves relocating out of the Texas Pavilion 
but remaining in the hemisphere district. The third option is staying right here, and that includes redesigning or modifying the existing building. It also includes much needed renovations and upgrades to get the ITC to national accreditation standards like the McNay and Witte Museums. The restrooms and accessibility and IT infrastructure that are all a part of meeting the standards for AAM to which we aspire. The next step is to get feedback from the community, conservation and preservation groups that will be presented to UTSA President Taylor Amy. An online survey is on UTSA's website right now and the process could take up to four months. And we have no doubt that our community, you know, how people feel about this varies amongst individuals. That's an opportunity for UTSA to be a good steward of the ITC, not just for the past 50 years, but for the next 50 years. RJ Marcus, KSAT 12 News. The San Antonio Zoo putting its support behind a bill in Congress that aims to provide funding for vulnerable species. Advocates and zoo staff today talked about how the Recovering America's Wildlife Act would benefit the San Antonio Zoo. If passed, it would give nearly $1.5 billion a year to fund state live wildlife plans. Animals that it would benefit, the whooping crane, horned lizard, and sea turtles. You know, as we're transforming Texas, you know, we're degrading and fragmenting habitat. We're uh, you know, creating, creating uh, intense competition for water resources, introducing those invasive species and causing other problems. But the good news is that we have so many uh, success stories for conservation. The full U.S. House may vote on the bill in the coming weeks. Are you not know, been joking around? The last you, few days about you. how I'm just looking for some <laughs> shade or whatever, but I actually think the shade paid off for us today. It Sarah. really did. Uh, you were throwing some shade at the. I was throwing time. shade. <laughs> there we go. Yes, thank okay. you, Sarah. Uh, but hey, yeah, we did have plenty of cloud cover today, and it felt fine outside. The aquifer actually up at two tenths of a foot over the past 24 hours. We had a few sprinkles here and there, but nothing that amounted to any kind of significant rain. Molds are present in low amounts, but here's the thing: tomorrow, Saharan dust is going to become dense in the air, and you'll definitely notice it. I'll be talking a bit about that coming up in a bit. But for now, take a look outside. It's 93 degrees and windy gusts up to 25 miles per hour tonight. Not too shabby. Temperatures will fall into the 80s and it will be windy at times. But once again, we're back to the heat tomorrow. I've got to look at that heat high where it's headed. And of course, that's the hair and dust coming up after the break. I'm Stefania Jimenez and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the night beat a step toward vaccinations for young children when it comes to COVID how today's decision could affect families and the latest on San Antonio's COVID situation more than two years into the pandemic plus no decision yet on abortion from the U.S. Supreme Court but we're looking at the potential fallout if Roe versus Wade is overturned we'll discuss the struggles that already exist in the adoption process and why it may be better to leave a random dollar on the ground rather than picking it up. The unusual warning from one law enforcement agency. We'll see you for these stories and more tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks, Stephania. All right, Mother Nature can throw shade at us anytime because it is 92 degrees yeah. out there. We'll take this kind of shade. Yeah, we yeah. Will. yeah. You know what, guys? 95 was the high temperature for the day. A massive improvement from over the weekend when we were at 105. So yes. not too bad, but I hate to say this. We're going to be back to the triple digits tomorrow. Let's take a look outside, see how we fared for the day. You can see those clouds there. It's 90, 95 was the high temperature for the day uh, today, and we were able to see temperature is about two degrees above average, but this is the closest we've been to average in a while. And average is good this time of year. Average is where we want to be. It was 99 in Gonzales, 99 in Pleasanton, 100 in Yavaldi. It was 101 in Del Rio and 103 in Catula. You could see which areas got more sunshine than San Antonio today. The areas where temperatures were uh, closer to 100 degrees, like in Hondo, but it was only 92 in Kerrville. Outside right now, 93. We are seeing those winds gusting up to about 25 miles per hour. 
shower from the southeast. Those winds are going to be with us throughout the day, but the skies are going to clear. So as we head into the later evening hours, we'll be looking at mostly cloudy skies, but those uh, clouds return by early tomorrow morning. We'll have mostly cloudy skies early tomorrow morning, but once again, skies are going to clear fairly quickly by lunch. It'll be mostly sunny and it's going to be mostly sunny in the afternoon tomorrow. As far as highs go, 101 in San Antonio, 102 in Castroville. It'll be 100 in Seguin, 102 in Nixon, 102 in Divine, 102 in Sabinal. It'll be 97 in Bernie and 97 in Bulverde. Temperatures were mainly in the 80s today for Bernie and Bulverde, so a lot warmer tomorrow for those areas across the hill country. As we take a look across the nation here, we've got a low pressure system that's actually sparking off some severe weather across parts of uh, Wisconsin, some tornadoes uh, possible up there, but by far the stronger system is the heat high and the heat high has made it hot not only here in San Antonio, but across much of the nation. Currently it's 95 degrees in Chicago. It's warmer in Chicago than it is in San Antonio today because of this heat high. But over the coming days, this heat high is going to settle back over Texas. And so that's why tomorrow we'll be at 101 degrees. It'll be 100 on Friday, 100 on Saturday, and that heat high is just not going anywhere. By Father's Day and Juneteenth, temperatures will be back into the triple digits as well. So just to recap for your Thursday tomorrow, waking up with some clouds, it'll be 76 degrees. We'll gradually warm up by lunch. It'll be 92 and skies will be clearing around lunch and in the afternoon, mostly sunny 101. Winds will not be as windy tomorrow as they were today. We'll see winds sustained at about 10 to 15 miles per hour with gusts up to 20. Uh, still breezy, but today we've seen gusts up to about 35 miles per hour. Something to keep note of too is that the Saharan dust, we're going to see a more dense plume of the Saharan dust tomorrow. So let me take you through uh, the forecast here for tomorrow. As you can see, it becomes dense from San Antonio down to Corpus Christi. Then by Friday, we'll still have some dust in the air, but it'll start to clear out. And by Saturday, really only a light plume of Saharan dust over the weekend. But because the Saharan dust plume comes and goes, we'll see it back into the area by the middle of this upcoming week next week. And again, if you are particularly sensitive to the dust, you may want to limit your time outdoors tomorrow. It could impact those with respiratory issues. The air will be unhealthy for those who are sensitive to it, but generally most of us will just notice a haze on the horizon and perhaps some light allergy like symptoms. So let's recap everything for you. Windy tomorrow, but not as windy as today. Saharan dust through Friday, triple digits every single day over the next seven to 10 days, including over the weekend and into next week. No significant chance for rain and coming up in the next half hour we're going to talk about the fact that because it's been so dry that's why we're so hot outside kind of looks like we hit a jackpot but it does not feel that way no <laughs> Thanks, we should Sarah. get something for that many right? straight days yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right, so I love the College World Series. Have I mentioned that? You have. There are certain traditions that only you can get in Omaha, Andrew Seely. So I'm glad both Texas teams are, both major Texas teams are there. That's right, and Texas A&M specifically is there for the first time since 2017. And there's a local talent on the team that's doing some serious damage. We'll come back, we'll hear from Jordan Thompson on his performance in the Super Regional against Louisville. Plus, San Antonio FC ready for another home game this Friday, this Saturday. Excuse me, got that too. Next. So for the first time since 2017, Texas A&M is in the College World Series. The Aggies swept Louisville last weekend in the Super Regional to punch their tickets to Omaha. And Bernie Champion alum Jordan Thompson was at the heart of a dramatic rally in Game 1. Thompson went 2 for 4 at the plate with 3 RBI, including the game-tying 2-run homer in the bottom of the 7th in an eventual 5-4 to four victory. Thompson was a member of last year's squad that finished at the bottom of the SEC West standings. So how does he feel making it this far in 2022? It's kind of hard to put into words just knowing where we finished last year then compared to this year just with all the with all I guess doubters that we had coming into the season just to prove them wrong and just stay within our team and not push for anything it just feels great. The Aggies will take on Oklahoma in their first game of the double elimination tournament Friday at 1 p.m. Later that same night number nine Texas faces Notre Dame first pitch in that one is scheduled for 6 p.m.
In the majors, Rangers hosting the Astros this afternoon, looking for the series win against after dropping last night's game 4-3. to three. Bases loaded top of the first. Jordan Alvarez smokes a double down the right field line and into the corner. Jose Altuve and Michael Brantley both come in to score, kickstarting a six-run inning. And the Astros roll to a big win 9-2. San Antonio FC stepped out of USL Championship competition last night to face San Luis from Liga MX at Toyota Field, and results were not in their favor. The Alamo City Club lost the match 4-0, but the good news is that this was just an international friendly, and 11 Pro Academy players got a chance to take the pitch in place of the usual starters who got the night off. After a month and a half away from home, the rest was necessary. I think every guy in, in this locker room wanted to play. Uh, I'll be completely honest with you, but at the same time, we have to know our bodies and we have to know how much we've traveled in the past couple weeks, in the past couple months, and I think that's important. Everyone's really excited to be back. Um, you know, I think a couple of us spoke about it, just being like, man, like we cannot wait for a home game again, just to like, it just brings a different kind of energy and momentum that we can carry through. Next up, SAFC has a home match against Oakland Roots SC Saturday at 8 p.m. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Day two of the Cowboys' mandatory minicamp is in the books, and Dak Prescott is a full participant. Last year, he spent the majority of minicamp working his way back from a compound fracture and dislocation of his right ankle that he suffered during the 2020 season. Whether he was overly cautious or not, Prescott's running numbers were down compared to earlier in his career. He only ran 48 times for 146 yards and a touchdown in 2021. Prescott's plan is to be more decisive. He's gone back and analyzed plays where he chose to throw instead of run, but it takes more than just analysis to fix a habit. I can say that post snap, but why didn't I do it at that time? You know, why didn't I react that? So looking at that is going back in this time of this offseason and, and reacting that way, making myself react that way at times. So when I come to the game, getting those scenarios, it's, it's second nature. We're not looking back saying what if or if I could have done that. And I mean, I don't play the game with with regret. So it's just about going out there and playing my preparation. And check this out. Jason Garrett is heading back to NBC's, excuse me, heading back to Sundays on NBC's Football Night in America as an analyst. The former Cowboys head coach has recently made his broadcast debut during USFL games as a color commentator. Garrett was fired as the New York Giants offensive coordinator in November, and he hasn't ruled out a return to the sideline in the future. Now, granted, I have not had a chance to hear him on the mic. But I can imagine their mics must be pretty good considering he's likely still clapping in the booth. The well, that's what I was going to say. He's, he's a good clapper. We know that. Yeah, he's got that part down. We'll see if he's got the rest of it. By the way, if Dak Prescott takes off more, he'd be a forerunner. <laughs> that's a good one. I'll leave that. Thank you. Book. Thank you. <laughs> Is it? We'll be. <laughs>
Yes, it took what happens. People had high expectations of inflation. And so that really got built into the economy. So the Federal Reserve had to raise interest rates to 20 percent, which caused a, um, a severe recession to wring that inflation out of the economy. When you look at stocks right now, a lot of people have 401ks, a lot of people worried about their retirement. Is is the stock market reacting to what the Fed is doing and inflation? Is that what we're seeing reflected in the stock market or is there more at play there? Well, today it was clearly the stock market went up. And the reason why is that going up three quarters of a percentage point instead of a half was uh, indicating that the Fed was serious about inf fighting inflation. So that investors had more confidence in the Fed that the inflation rate would come down in the future. And I think that's the, really the main story behind it. But generally, higher interest rates are bad for stocks because it makes other investments more attractive like bonds. Whether viewers at home watching this are familiar with the stock market or not, none of this sounds like good news. So what is the impact going to be to the average person with this interest rate increase? And when could we start to see that? Well, you're going to start seeing some effects pretty quickly because some rates are tied to uh, the federal funds rate, which is the rate the Fed controls. And uh, so it's going to ripple through the economy. But it's going to take time to fully get there. It could take a year and a half to have the full impact of this change. Um, but it'll start relatively quickly. When we talk recession, and then uh, I said we heard a, a new word today that was introduced, not new, but a new term that we haven't heard in a while called stagflation. Are you confident that what is going to happen is going to not affect people? Are we, are, is a recession inevitable? Is stagflation something we should be worried about? I mean, what are you seeing for the average American out there when it comes to prices, when it comes to retirement and stocks? Yeah, in terms of, uh, of, of the recession, I think that's got a higher probability uh, now than in the past because uh, the Federal Reserve is gonna have to really increase interest rates to get this inflation under control and their track record of avoiding uh, a recession, what economists call soft landing, has not been good. So the odds of having a recession are pretty high. Um, obviously, we've lost over 20% in the stock market already this year, and we're in a bear market. Um, and so that's going to hurt people who are retiring in the near future. So uh, I would expect that that would increase. Previous recessions have, or declines like this have shown that people tend to work longer who are close to retirement as a result of these declines because their value of their pension fund has fallen. Can you explain a bear Instead, market for us? Oh, sorry. Good question. Bear market is when uh, the uh, stock prices have fallen at least 20 percent relative to their previous peak. And that's what we're in right now. And he said in the in the past, how long has it taken to rebound from a recession? Well, uh, the longest ones are uh, the uh, 2007 to 2009. That's one of the longest ones uh, in recent post-war history. And that was December 2007 to June 09. So it's about a year and a half. And of course, you had the Great Depression, which lasted uh, almost a decade. But um, since World War II, a year and a half would be a, a uh, upper bound, typically. Other recessions tend to be shorter. I'm curious if you have any indication on the flip side of that from where we are now until officially entering a recession. What's the timetable look like given the, our current conditions? Well, I wouldn't be surprised in the next year we start to enter a recession. Um, and a recession is defined as two quarters of falling output. Uh, in the economy. And so, uh, you know, this Federal Reserve hikes and in interest rates are going to start to cut people's uh, borrowing and therefore spending. And then that will bring inflation down, which they want to. But like you said, there's not going to be as if we go into a recession, that's not a soft landing. David McPherson. That's right. Yeah. David yeah. McPherson. That's economics. A hard yeah, it's a very hard landing. <laughs> David McPherson, economics professor at Trinity University. Always appreciate your time, sir. Well, thank you. We'll be right back.
We have some breaking news just into the case at 12 newsroom. San Antonio police releasing two body camera videos for two separate incidents where officers fired their weapons at a suspect. The first one is this one from May 27th in the 8800 block of Topsy Street. Officers responding to a shots fired call the suspect 43 year old Jaffeth Perea. According to police, he fired shots at the officers. The officers returned fire striking Perea. He is currently in jail. Again, this is video we just got moments ago. And that second shooting involving San Antonio police happened just one day later in the 1200 block of Ada Street. This was on May 28th. Officers responded to a report of an intoxicated man shooting a gun outside. Police say after they arrived and tried talking 29 year old Roger Flores into dropping the weapon, he allegedly pointed his gun at officers and police shot him. Flores is also currently in police custody. We are currently working right now to post both videos on our website at KSAT.com. And of course, we'll have the very latest on the night beat after hockey tonight. But right now, let's check out the live cam out there. Look at the, the cloud cover. It's a beautiful thing, Some is it not? Welcome shade. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing because it kept us from getting to 100 yes, degrees indeed. today. Oh my goodness. And while we will have some clouds early tomorrow morning, here's the thing. We're going to be back to 100 tomorrow, even above 100 degrees tomorrow. Also, the Saharan dust will become dense for your Thursday. We'll talk about those two things. And of course, a sizzling Father's Day weekend. And I'm not just talking about Dad's Grill. I'll have that forecast for you coming up. In the buzz today, an online era officially coming to an end today. It's likely that most PC users moved on a long time ago, aside from a few stalwarts sticking with Internet Explorer. Microsoft is shutting down what was once the king of Internet browsers and will no longer support the application on certain versions of its Windows 10 operating system. So I should take it off my computer. <laughs> yeah, I haven't sure. used it in a while, but it's still down it's there. It's on mine too. Yeah. yeah. Internet Explorer debuted in 1995 as part of the Windows 95 operating system. It was an instant hit. At one point, commanded 95% of the browser market. Now it supposedly sits at around 5%. Microsoft even turned its back on the browser, releasing an entirely new app called Microsoft Edge in 2015. For the last two years, it's been slowly removing support for Internet Explorer within its own products. All right. If you've got a small fortune burning a hole in your pocket, you have a shot at taking home a rare portrait. Sotheby's is auctioning the study for portrait of Lucian Freud painted by Francis Bacon in 1964. It is the centerpiece of a three panel picture of Bacon's longtime friend. Yeah, the entire triptych was br briefly on display in 1965, but was later separated into individual pieces. One of the sections is in a private collection, the other being held in a Jerusalem museum. Officials expect the June 29th auction could get offers up to $42 million for this piece. Well, I take that back. Big fortune if you have a big fortune it's, flying around. It's a lot of bacon. <clears throat> All right, whether you're a pro or you just take pictures for fun, today's a good day to get that camera out. Take a picture of the great outdoors. It is National Nature Photography Day, whether it's a deer in the park, Sunset throughout the Saharan dust. Outdoor beauty is all around us. And since almost everyone has a camera on them these days, taking a quick picture never has never been easier. And so it's posting them to your social media of choice so others can see. Maybe send them to KSAT Connect so go. Sarah Spivey can put it on her weathercast. The North American Nature Photography Association designated June 15th National Nature Photography Day back in 2009. When it comes to the weather, we rely quite a bit on nature photography, I guess. Our, our viewers, I, I always say, our viewers do a great job yes. capturing weather events that happen around the city. We get sunset pictures just about every single day, and of course, when there's storms, Hail. We, we really get good pictures yeah, in from absolutely. our KSAT viewers. So that's on our Weather Authority app. 
please join. Post those pictures. We'd love to see them and use them. Okay, though today we did get a nice break from the excessive heat. It was still hot out there, but a break from the triple digits. Here's a look at the current satellite and temperatures. You can see very clearly the areas that got more sunshine. It's still 101 in Catula and 100 in Laredo. It's 99 in Uvalde and 99 in Del Rio. But around San Antonio, temperatures are in the low to mid 90s. That's it. Even in the 80s in some places, like in Bernie, it's 88 degrees, 88 in Canyon Lake, only 90 in Bulverde, 89 in Kerrville. You can see the clouds. Pretty much half of Bear County is in total sun, and the other half is dealing with those overcast skies right now. But overnight, uh, we're going to see skies clear before midnight, before we see them build back in by the early morning hours tomorrow. Now, the reason for the extra clouds and even some sprinkles is because of this swirl in the atmosphere. You can see it really well on the water vapor imagery here. Well, that's headed out. That's moving north. And so we're going to be left with the only other big weather influencer in our area, which is unfortunately this heat high. Now it's off to the east. That's what allowed for that low to bring us a little bit of clouds, but that big weather maker is going to be moving right overhead. So it's going to be very hot over the coming days. So just as quickly as we got a little bit of relief, we're going to be going back to the heat. As far as the rest of the nation, there are some severe storms across parts of Wisconsin and pushing into Missouri and Iowa at the moment as well. But that heat high going to be moving overhead. And so I hate to do this, but I, there really is not going to be any relief from the triple digit heat over the next seven to 10 days at least. Just about every day here, including tomorrow, we're going to be near 100, forecasting a high temperature of 101 for your Thursday. So why have we been so hot this early? We have seen 14 100 degree days. The primary reason is because we are in drought. The ground is dry. There is no soil moisture, at least very little soil moisture. And anytime we have low soil moisture, the atmosphere warms up quickly. You can see that there's exceptional extreme drought, fresh drought monitor coming out tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that. But compared right now to this time last year when we had a relatively cooler start to summer. We had no drought around San Antonio, hardly any drought across the South Central Texas uh, region. And so we were able to have a cooler summer because we had some soil moisture in the air, at least for the beginning of the summer months. Also factor in that summers are getting hotter in San Antonio. Since 1970, we've had 37 more days where the temperature has been above average. So generally summers are getting hotter every now and then you'll have a cooler summer than usual like last year, but still uh, the trend continues that when it's hot, it's going to be hotter and that's the case so far this year and this summer for us in your case at 12 hour forecast for early tomorrow 76 degrees in the morning hours. We are going to have mostly cloudy skies early tomorrow. It's still going to be breezy, but not necessarily as windy as it was today. Of south wind sustained at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Around noon, we'll start to see skies clear, 92 degrees. And then in the afternoon, that's when we really crank up the heat, 101 for the forecast high with mostly sunny skies in San Antonio. Elsewhere, it'll be 102 in Uvalde, 103 in Carrizo Springs, 101 in Gonzales, 99 in Canyon Lake, and 98 in Kerrville. I do got to remind you that the Saharan dust is going to be dense tomorrow. We're going to see a dense plume of Saharan dust, so the air quality will be unhealthy for those who are sensitive to the Saharan dust. There will be some allergy like symptoms, but by the weekend we see that dust plume really thin out and then looking ahead again. It's all about that triple digit forecast for us. Not going to be letting up, including on Father's Day and Juneteenth when it'll be 101 degrees. That's what I meant. Sizzling Father's Day forecast. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. You're watching GMSA on this Wednesday, June 15th. Diversity yard signs in rainbow lettering cut in half and a Pride Month flag ripped to shreds. Those responsible leaving this evidence of hate behind for students and staff to see as they made their way into the quads at St. Philip's College. According to Alamo College Police, they're investigating and do have cameras in the area, but have not gotten a suspect description at this time. We're working to learn the name of a man killed in a car crash early this morning. According to SAPD, the 39-year-old crashed around 6.30 on South Sarzamora at Hunter's Pond. That's on the south side. Officers believe the driver may have been drowsy before he drove off the road. His car 
then wrapped around a tree. In a unanimous vote of the members present Saturday afternoon, an advisory committee approved this map to send to city council. The red lines show where the boundaries are now, while the multicolored portions show where they would go. These changes are the results of six and a half months of meetings. Only District 2 and 3 remain unchanged, but in general, more populated north side districts had to shrink, so the smaller districts around downtown and the west side could grow. As we continue to remember the lives lost in the Uvalde shooting, we're taking a moment to remember 11 year old Layla Salazar. Visitation services held for her today. She'll be laid to rest tomorrow. The family says that Layla loved to swim and dance, and she recently took home first place ribbons for races that were held at Robb Elementary. She also liked to listen to Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses while in the car with her dad on the way to school. Bit by bit, Bitcoin appears to be crumbling. The most valuable cryptocurrency in the world is trading for slightly above $20,000 on Wednesday. That's down 15% since the start of the week and roughly a third since February, according to data from crypto exchange Coinbase. One economic analyst says if Bitcoin falls below the $20,000 threshold, it would result in a tailspin. Bitcoin's not the only one struggling either. Ether, the second most valuable digital coin, has lost nearly 80% of its value since November. Coinbase saying it fears a crypto winter is laying off 18% of its staffers. And just a reminder, tomorrow that Saharan dust is going to be back in a pretty big way. And then also the heat, too. Although we'll start off in the 70s, it is going to get to 101 for the high temperature. That would be our 15th 100 degree day already. And we're just at June 15th. Looking ahead, adding on more to that triple digit tally as we head into the weekend, too. Although dust will thin out over the weekend, so at least we won't have to deal with that. Otherwise, going to be hot. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for watching the News at 6. We'll see you on the Night Beat after the game.